I'm Elizabeth Legg. I'm the chair of the Department of what is still called the Department of Art. We're actually art historians, but we take prestige wherever we can get it. Um, I'm delighted, as I said, to be chairing this panel of people who will all be talking about things they know a great deal about. Um, I was rather flattered this morning. I told my son I was chairing this panel on sex and sexuality, and he looked thoughtful and said, horses for courses. But he was being funny. He was being ironic. I did feel flattered. I'm pleased to introduce our first uh, speaker, Asato Ikeda, who was originally from Tokyo, but pursued her post-secondary degrees in Canada, uh, including her doctorate at UBC. I ask the speakers to please send me a short biography so that I would be sure to say about them what they wanted to be said about them. Rather interestingly, what Asato left out of her short biography was the amazing fact that she had the Governor General's Gold Medal awarded <clears throat> for her doctoral dissertation on the art and visual culture of Japan during World War II. She is currently a professor at Fordham University. Her research interests lie in modern Japanese art uh, in particular and Asian art in general and the topics of imperialism versus, I guess you could say, colonialism, war, fascism, museums, sex, gender, and sexuality. Her forthcoming monograph, Fashioning Fascism, Japanese paintings during the Second World War revisits the question of Japanese fascism. It's coming out in 2017, soon, right? Yes. As a curator, Asato has been keen to engage with the public about important social and political issues in art. For example, she co-curated with Norman Verano a traveling exhibition, Japanese Inspiration, early printmaking in the Canadian Arctic, and she was the curatorial lead for a really interesting dispersed exhibition, Retell, Rethink, Recover, at UBC, dealing with the history of disasters, including nuclear, of course, in Japan. Most recently, as the first Bishop White postdoctoral fellow of Japanese art, she has curated the exhibition uh, a Third Gender, Beautiful Youths in Japanese Prints, which is the exhibition now at the ROM, which you are all going to see, have you not done so already, which focused on the social and sexual role of youths in the Edo period in Japan. Um, Asato is currently researching, I guess as the Bishop White Fellow, the exchanges between Japan and Canada through arts and visual culture in the late 19th and 20th century, looking at, for example, the Canadian collector of Japanese art, Sir Edmund Walker, the photographic collections of Canadian women who lived in Japan, and those Japanese Canadian artists who were interned in this country during the Second World War. Uh, she also is looking at the Inuit Japan exchange in the field of printmaking, artistic and cultural remembering of the Second War World War in our contemporary multicultural Canada in a time when the relationship between perpetrator and victim entails very layered and complex ethnic histories uh, in this country. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the introduction. And I'd like to also thank um, the Center for Sexual Diversity Studies at U of D, and Brenda Cosman in, part, in particular, and Sasha um, also from the ROM um, for organizing this panel. And it's great to be back in Canada. The exhibition, A Third Gender, Beautiful Youth in Japanese Prints, opened at the ROM in May. The exhibition showcases visual representations of male youth called wakashu in Japanese in prints produced during the, the Edo period, which lasted from the 17th to the 19th century. During the Edo period, 
Wakashi were the object of sexual desire for both adult men and women. The exhibition presents a new definition of gender, one that is not determined only by biological sex or the sexual organs with which one is born. In the, in the exhibition, gender also involves age, role in sexual hierarchy, and appearance. Wakashu, identified by their distinct hairstyle, took the passive role with adult men, but generally the active role with women. Arguing that Wakashu constituted a separate gender, the exhibition makes us rethink gender binarism and the idea that there are only two genders. While there have been a number of scholarly writings on the topic, such as monographs by historian Gary Leap and Gregory Pulfelder, a third gender is the first museum exhibition to focus on the role of Edo period male youth. Since the museums are where scholarly findings interface with the general public, as a curator, I have to consider how contemporary audiences might understand the Edo period sexual relations. In particular, Edo period gender relations involving male youth challenge the generally felt, held beliefs and the morality of people in contemporary North America, that is, that youth should not be sexualized. The questions I considered quite seriously in the exhibition pro preparation process were whether male same-sex relations or nanshoku might be understood as a form of pedophilia, which is defined as a mental disorder characterized by sexual predilection for prepubescent girls or boys, and whether prints that show the male youth having sex might be considered child pornography, which is defined as images that depict sexually explicit activities involving a child under the age of 18. Ultimately, after consulting with a criminal lawyer through the Center for Sexual Diversity Studies at the University of Toronto, who did not think the Edo period prints would be classified as child pornography, in the end, I opted to include a few prints that show wakashu in explicit sexual activity. But also, I specifically addressed the questions of pedophilia and child pornography in the exhibition in the introduction of the exhibition catalog. To begin with, none of the wakashu prints portrayed specific individuals, and it is therefore virtually impossible to assign a precise age to any of the peoples depicted. More importantly, we must understand the subject the prints portray by situating Edo period human relations within their own historical context rather than imposing a contemporary psychiatric framework on sexual practices of the past. We must understand, in other words, that for most of history, individuals were considered sexually mature when they re reached the stage of puberty, and that as life expectancy was shorter, people typically took on reproductive responsibilities much earlier than they do today. Romantic and sexual relations with pubescent teenagers were not just legal, but also normative in Edo, in Edo period Japan, though this is not the case in contemporary Western society, where sex between an adult and a minor is generally criminalized, and depending on the age of the subject in question, defined as statutory rape or ch child sexual abuse. Intergenerational sexual relations are legal if both, both parties are over 18 years old, but they seem to be generally frowned upon. Scholars of Japanese culture are indeed in general agreement that nanshoku was not a form of pedophilia. It is for this reason that Margaret Child has criticized Paul Gordon Shallow's rendering of wakashu as boy in his translation of Ihara Saikaku's The Great Mirror of Male Love, or nanshoku okagami. Child writes, quote, one difficulty is translating wakashu as boy and describing nanshoku as man boy love. Our word boy includes children, but the term wakashu normally does not. Wak wakashu actually refers to adolescent youth, males who are making the transition to adulthood. 
Their ages usually range from 11 or 12 to 19 or 20. To refer to these teenagers as boys risks the assumption that nanshuku was pedophilia and constituted child abuse. They might, might have, may have been such a component in such male homosexual relations, but readers should not be led to believe that such features characterize nanshoku in general. In the exhibition catalog, I took this occasion to think about the Edo pure gender structure as an opportunity to point out and reflect on how unique our own society is in having become so sensitive about age as it relates to sexuality. As recently as a few, few decades ago, this was not the case. For example, princesses in early Disney movies who functioned as role models for girls are almost always young. The first D Disney princess, Snow White, who first appeared in the 1930s and falls in love with in, and is ultimately saved by a handsome prince, is only 14 years old. Vladimir Navkov's novel, Lolita, initially written by the Russian author in English in the 1950s, is about a romantic relationship between a male professor in his 30s and a 12-year-old girl. It generated controversy, but was not considered illegal, and was made into a film by Stanley Kubrick in 1962. The general desire of society to prevent the sexualization or sexual exploitation of children is in fact contradicted by the realities of today's capitalist society, especially in the realm of mass media and fashion. Teen and even preteen celebrities are objects of fascination for people young and old. Pop stars Britney Spears and Justin Bieber, for example, have been both romanticized and sexualized by the media, whether implicitly or explicitly, ever since they were barely teenagers. I do understand that the issue of youth and sex is indeed a sensitive one. The problem is not limited to pedophilia, but is also, by extension, related to global social concerns over child marriage and human trafficking that make people, mostly young and female, into sexual commodities. The Arthur Gender exhibition, however, was meant to understand gender practices and sexual relations of the Edo period, not to promote or advocate them in our contemporary society. I also consider that opening up a public discussion about sex, gender, and sexuality is more important than simply ignoring a sensitive topic and shutting down an opportunity for dialogue and reflection. In the end, I'm pleased with the fact that what I produced was not just a scholarly book about Wakashu, making it an exhibition that engages with the general public, allowed for a more discursive conversation about important topic of sex, gender, and sexuality through examination of history and artistic objects. I like to think that After Gender is an exhibition that not only offers provocative information and interesting content, but also proposes a new model of museum exhibitions that make use of scholarship and historical objects and address them in a way that makes make us think differently about our own society. Thank you very much.